Um, first, I want to thank you for um, agreeing to this. Oh, thank you for uh, for interviewing me and uh, giving me a chance to talk with you. Great, great. Uh, my very, very first question, Father Matt, is what is the brief, if you know or if you can articulate, the brief history of the Episcopal Church? Oh. Um, a brief history of the Episcopal Church is sort of a fascinating one um, because it's a church born out of strife. There's two warring factions being right the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church um, in England. And um, the, the big part of all of that is, uh, you know, everyone knows King Henry VIII and him wanting a divorce, which kind of starts the thing. But for years they end up fighting between these two, and I mean fight, like bloodbaths. And eventually when Queen Elizabeth takes over, she says, I want to be a church of the middle way. I want both these groups to be able to worship together and not fight anymore. Um, and she finds a way to do that. And that's one of the places that um, draws me to the church, is being a church of the middle way. When groups are unable to come together, unable to, to work things out, to find something that draws us together bigger than our differences. Um, and in the church, that's, that's Jesus Christ. That's the, the love of God for the world that draws us together to get past ourselves. And um, so that's that when I hear the Episcopal Church and how kind of it started, it starts out of England. Um, it's the Anglican Church. And um, so we're a part of the Anglican Communion. And um, we're just the, this Episcopal branch of that. Uh, or the United States branch of the uh, Anglican Communion. Very great, very nice, very nice. And uh, what is the brief history of the Fremont location here? Um, in Fremont, we were actually here before Fremont was Fremont. Wow. Um, so 1842, a group of, uh, I'm guessing English men and women got together and walked over to the courthouse and filed the paperwork. And when they filed the paperwork, they became St. Paul's Episcopal Church um, in Lower Sandusky. That's what it was called at the time. And 1843, they started building and they built, um, actually the bones of the church that's there is that, that 1843 structure. Um, they've, you know, added on and changed things and built other things. But there's this good portion in the middle that's still 1843. Um, in 1849, of course, Fremont became Fremont. They renamed it after an explorer and that, but... Yeah. Um, so that's our brief history. Amazing. And, oh, honestly, the other piece is I think we're the oldest church that's still in its original like location with the building um, nice. in, in Fremont. So that's kind of a, that's an interesting, our little claim to fame, I guess. Right, and um, if I'm mistaken, um, I read on Wikipedia that uh, Rutherford behaves, you know, despite his, in my honest opinion, his complicated legacy, you know, with um, any reconstruction to make, making the deal with the Southern Congress people to become president during that electoral tie of the election that was the election of 1976. Though he, when he, before the Civil War, he did help out a lot of runaway slaves. So that's why I say it's a complicated legacy. Mm -hmm. You know, on one hand, he, he actually got wounded in the Civil War fighting for the Union, but on the other hand, he kind of delayed progress for a lot of recently eman emancipated or um, liberated slaves. Mm -hmm. You know, with Jim Crow. Jim Crow arguably started under his administration. But the reason I bring, bring him up is because, despite his complicated legacy, he was a member of that church, right? No. He wasn't? No. Oh, uh, wow. So. Hayes was, um, I think he, he, along with a lot of other presidents, refused to be a member of a church because oh, wow. they didn't want to end up as a, right, um, they wanted to keep that separation. Yes, yes. And so a lot of presidents end up saying, you know, oh, they gave up, they'll give up church affiliation. And I think um, Hayes bounced around to different places. His wife was notoriously United Methodist, yeah. which is why we actually have Hayes Memorial United Methodist Church. Oh, oh. Um, so, because she was a notorious giver to that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's that's sort of their legacy. Oh, I didn't know that. Legacy. Yeah. And uh, as far as I know, he, he might have been an Episcopalian at one point, but generally, um, as presidents take on the presidency, they had kind of said, you know, I'm not promoting a necessary one. Yeah. 
thing, at least just as far as I know. Now, I've only been in Fremont for five years, mm -hmm. so um, someone who knows uh, more, yeah, you know, President Hayes' history a lot better than I do in my short time here, I'm probably feeling a lot uh, better. Very understandable, yes, yes. Um, how would you say that, you know, you mentioned that it's like the middle ground between uh, Protestant and Catholic, so that's pretty much like the main difference between other denominations. Yeah. Is that it's you know like because I, I don't Europe they had that Thirty Years War which you know like you said was an actual war that's what it was right the Thirty Year War uh, so the the war that kind of comes out of um, for us it would actually be the ones just in England warring Catholics and Protestants okay and so Bloody Mary Bloody Mary yeah. yes um, and you know also Edward wasn't so nice to the Catholics mm -hmm. Mary who's Catholic wasn't so nice to the Protestants yeah. and they end up killing a lot of people a lot of bishops a lot of you know clergy a lot of well-meaning you know churchgoers mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it was a, a really ugly time period. Yeah, and of course, they had that, they, they eventually warred with like France, Hundred Years' War, um, you know, the yeah. Spanish Armada. Um, See, you're getting uh, into the history that I'm not the greatest with, so my European history is not uh, oh, phenomenal yeah. with all no of worries. this. And, no problem, no problem. Um, so, I, so your question originally was about the Episcopal Church and what makes it uh, different from different. other denominations. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I would start off with is uh, our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, often says, uh, you know, we're the Episcopal branch of this Jesus movement, which just helps to, to locate what we're doing. Um, there's a lot of ways... We're the same as all the other people. We're, we're Christians that love Jesus and believe love is the way mm -hmm. um, to not just a better place for all of us, yeah. but love, love is God's way in this world. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is bigger than the Episcopal Church. Yes. And um, there's things that I love about the Episcopal Church because I wasn't raised in it. I became an Episcopalian um, probably about 10 years ago. And so what I, I've loved about the Episcopal Church is the fact that it lives out deeply love being the way. Yeah. Um, so first of all, it owns the, it's a church that's owned the sins of its past and mm -hmm. is owning the sins of its past. So um, we've had a lot of, of problems in our past. The Episcopal Church, we had bishops that were slave owners. We did not speak out against slavery um, until mu way too late in the game. Um, and we've actually, it's been a church that I've seen over and over again, own that and say, we're going to do better yes. and then act to do better. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, racial justice reform going on in the Episcopal church right now mm -hmm. and figuring out what does it look like to be a church that takes seriously its reform, yes. that takes seriously, um, wrongs done and how do we move forward? Um, and so to me, that's a big piece of, of love, being able to own when you've done something wrong mm -hmm. and then move forward in a way that takes that seriously. Like Jesus um, Christ said, you made the first sinless person cast a stone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so there's that beautiful piece to the Episcopal Church. Another piece that drew me in is uh, the fact that this is a church that um, that has that's now erring on the side of love in a lot of ways mm -hmm. um, and doesn't even I don't think it's never even an error um, I think it lives out that love in multiple ways and um, so the Episcopal Church one of the things that drew me into that whole thing was the fact that it's open and affirming to the LGBTQ members mm -hmm. um, that we're a church that doesn't put restrictions on God's love yes um, and um, figures out how to create community that is loving accepting um, and caring for each other. Um, so that's one of the things that I think has made the Episcopal Church unique in my eyes. Um, yeah, is there anything? Um, yes, yes. Um, the fourth question is, do you believe, now this is, um, I'll, just, I'll just jump to it. Do you believe all religious organizations, you know, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, anything, Anything that um, that wants to get political, that wants to get involved with the government, 
you know, like have influence in the government. Um, you know, like, um, you know, that wants to take something that that's secular yeah. and make it more religious um, or endorse a political candidate or get behind a referendum or initiative or recall, anything like that. Um, as Jesus Christ himself said, um, give Caesar what is due to Caesar, give to God what is due to God. Which, my interpretation of that, and you may disagree, is um, give to the government what's due to the government, give to your religion what's due to your religion. Um, that's my interpretation. What is your interp 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 interpretation of that? Yeah, so give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God is a, is a fascinating statement. It's, it's wonderful. So what's going on is somebody's trying to trip up Jesus, right? There, yeah. There's this um, argument happening that mm. either you give to um, Rome. So Rome isn't a wonderful, peaceful nation. Um, they, they use the word peace, but they do peace by military force, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they're actually the oppressors in Israel at this time. Yes. And the, of course, the Roman emperor is saying, you have to pay the tribute tax. We've yes. conquered you. Now you have to pay us or we're going to destroy you, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that's what's going on. So there's a group of Jewish people who say, it's wrong to pay the tribute tax. Why would you, why would you help out the people trying to oppress us? And then you have people who are saying, well, Rome's not all that bad. You, you know, like pay them and, and get them off our backs. And so they're asking Jesus this question to say, do you side with Rome and make all of the um, make all of the Israel, all the rulers in Israel or in, in uh, Judea angry with you? Or are you going to side with right the, this, this group of Jewish people and make Rome angry with you? So it's a trick question. If Jesus answers the question, right, one side's going to get angry. Yes. Um, and Jesus says, let me see the coin, right? And on the coin is the, the picture of Caesar and a claim to divinity. Mm -hmm. That Caesar claims to be God. And so on this coin, he says to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's. Um, and, right, this is the, this, Rome's claiming to be led by God who's Caesar. <laughs> and Jesus kind of sidesteps it that, like, figure, he's asking them to figure it out, right? And also all these people who know God and are believers in God, know that everything belongs to God anyways, mm -hmm. right? Um, even Caesar belongs to God. Yeah. Um, and so there's this wonderful thing that people have to figure it out. Yeah. Right? Jesus, as much as he's speaking plainly, he's also saying, you, you have the ability to reason and think. Mm -hmm. You can see injustice. You can see where it is. Um, and so in some ways, it's not endorsing a separation of church and state, because I don't think Jesus was thinking along, you know, the lines of, you know, United States government way later on. Yes, yes. Um, but I think he is very clearly saying, you know, like, you can answer this. We yes. can answer this without having to answer it and make everybody, you know, without falling into the trap that they've set. Yes, yes. He's asked them, I don't know, how are you going to handle your finances, mm -hmm. right? Are you going to, if everything belongs to God, what are you giving to God? Yes. And if you're saying things belong to Caesar, then okay, you can give the coin with Caesar's image on it back to him. Like that's, that's okay too. Yes. Um, and so he, as much as he answers the question, he doesn't answer the question and, and makes people think, which is the beautiful thing that Jesus does over and over again. Yes. Is people try to pigeonhole him into one way of being, and he says, right, a way of love always has to be a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, because as soon as you say, right, you have to do this, you can come up with a scenario yeah. where love might require you to do something different. Yes, yes. And that's why, right, Jesus goes to the greatest commandment, 
right? The golden rule. Yeah. Oh, no, the greatest command being love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, yeah, mind, right, right. and <laughs> love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, yes. Right? All the other commandments, all the other do this or this, fall that. under that. Yes. Um, and so, in a way, for the sake of love, mm -hmm. you, you can break the other rules. Um, and so that's, I think, what Jesus is asking. That's, right? that's great. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that, was a, that was a really, really good explanation, in my opinion. Um, and but you brought up something I thought, which, which is relevant, you know, even yeah. today. Think for yourself is essentially what that is. Yeah, yeah. Think for yourself. Unfortunately, um, we often find that people get don't think for themselves. So would you think that... Um, like, um, uh, like I guess before my before I was born, you might you might be old enough to remember this. Uh, the Moore majority, the um, religious right, that popped up at the turn of the um, decade, the 1980s, with Ronald Reagan and all that. Yeah. Um, that that really destroyed a lot of unions, lab good labor unions. Really destroyed a lot of uh, regulations. Really destroyed. Uh, things that, you know, working conditions, stuff like that. Um, not that I'm totally, you know, um, partisan in that way, but I guess, I guess to, to hopefully articulate this better is, do you believe that if, you know, there's some kind of clever but effective way to um, get people to think for themselves do you think taxation of churches that require their parishioners to give part of their paychecks to become members versus a suggested donation? Because you know those are essentially tips. It's essentially you know like a tip jar. You know, you know like if there's some kind of separation where it won't cause the good churches, in my opinion, to go bankrupt, but at the same time, it would erase the influence of. People that want to turn the United States into a theocracy. Hmm, that's an interesting question. I've I've never been a part of a church that demands um, giving, mm -hmm. um, but usually I you can't say, like right that money is an important thing to everybody, right? That, right. Um, and it that everything I think has a spiritual component. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we do with our money has a spiritual component. Um, I, I don't know about uh, how those other churches, if they should or shouldn't be, you say taxed? Well, or barely taxed, like the ones that, um, that seem to, well, well, not just fairly taxed, but the ones that get involved with government, the ones that get involved with politics, the ones that say, if you don't vote for this candidate, you're going to hell. Yeah, I think that is, uh, well, one, only one person has the, the, the ability to send anybody to hell, and it, it's none of us uh, clergy people, it's none of us people walking around here, right? Mm -hmm. right? That's, that's God's job, it's Jesus Christ. Um, that's, that's Christ's job. And Christ, oddly enough, as much as we would say he's the judge at the end of all of this, when we look at the way that Jesus lived life on earth through the scriptures, mm -hmm. he's the one who errs on the side of grace over and over again. Yes. Who cares for people over and over again. Who says, you know, well, let the, the sinner throw the first, or the one without sin throw the first mm -hmm. stone, like he said earlier. Yes. Right? That's the kind of judge we face at the end of all of this. Um, and that's beautiful. So when we talk about people trying to send other people to hell um, in such a way, whether it's for endorsing political candidates or however they want to try to draw those lines. Yeah, the fire brimstone. There, yeah. There's a judge at the end of all of this is the only one that gets to make that call. Mm -hmm. And that's the gracious, loving Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, so um, that's the one side of things is churches that might claim something like that um, are claiming a power they don't have. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think it, I don't think how you vote will ever, um, yeah. influence your, um, you know, see salvation at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's not a thing. Um, 
Well, but, and churches yes, that, that get very political like that, I honestly don't know what the repercussion should be of any of that stuff. Um, I, I'm just grateful that I don't have to be the person <laughs> to do it and make those um, calls. Yeah. I guess it's like, um, you know, there has to be some kind of systematic way, in my opinion, to, to kind of, you know, what Jesus said, think for your, you know, in so many words, think for yourself, you know, to be independent, to be free. That's essentially what it comes down to is freedom. To, yeah. to harmless freedom, I should say, harmless freedom, loving freedom. Yeah, yeah. To, you know, you know, the in a loving way, be free. And um, and I think, yeah, and, and freedom always sacrifices, right? Like yes. th there's a beautiful thing that um, I think sometimes people think freedom is about doing whatever you want with what you have. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's not. Freedom. Freedom is caring enough to sacrifice a bit of your freedom to make sure other people can be free with you. Yes. yes. Right? It, it always takes that. And without it, all you have is a bunch of tyrants running around. Exactly. Like, it, it doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. um, it, it takes love. It takes care. Yes. To, to make freedom. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, so I, I, I sidetracked somewhere and your question was... Um, um, that actually answers a lot of it. Okay. Uh, a great, great portion of it, and um, and um, and that I think that ties in nicely with uh, separation, with uh, with universal semi-direct democracy, which I'm a huge advocate for. Which is um, basically, you know, you had your leaders, but you had your people that could have as collectively as much power as the leaders, as a, as an even equal balance, yeah. the best balance possible. You know, I mean, not gonna be perfect. But, you know, it goes to a better system. Mm. And it, it can always be improved, trial and error, you know? Yeah, I, I think, uh, so one of the, the beautiful things in, in uh, the Christian scriptures, or the Jewish scriptures, right, mm -hmm. is humans are created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. um, that humans are created in a way to, to think, reflect, and have this, uh, this beautiful just being. Mm -hmm. um, and so at, at the core there, there's this and so one of the things I think democracy does beautifully is it recognizes that um, that people um, humans created in the image of God have a voice and we honor those voices um, and I love being a part of a system and um, expanding systems that, that hear people's voices their concerns their needs yes. um, and honestly if there's something that our country right now needs more than ever is the ability to listen to each other yes um, to, to hear and say like I hear your concern mm. not that like you change the way that you think but that you actually can hear the concerns of the other side and care mm -hmm. um, you know that is to me uh, one of the greatest gifts that um, democracy has and at mm. the end of the day we have to make a decision one way or the other on some issues yes but we do it respectfully mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me that oftentimes we're losing a lot of that respect in the way that we dialogue and that's heartbreaking yes. um, you have to be able to have that respect that care in order to maintain any sort of um, any sort of democracy, whether, whether it's representational democracy or what was the other one? Direct uh, a direct democracy. To maintain either one, mm -hmm. it comes with the respect for your other human beings. Yes. And um, that is one of those things that um, if we can see each other and honor each other as like people made in the image of God, like. Mm -hmm carrying something beautiful if I can treat you like I would treat Jesus whether I agree with you or disagree with you yes um, I think we will go a very long ways in making this place better whether it's one avenue or the other um, mm -hmm. to me I, I don't know I can't make government stuff um, I think there's probably a million ways you can do government yes um but all of them will fall apart. All of them will fall apart if we don't learn how to respect each other, if we don't learn how to love each other, if at the, at the core of them, 
Um, if the core ends up being power and grasping for power, it will always fall apart at the hands of you know, greedy, powerful people grabbing for more and possibly an uprise of people who have been oppressed for too long. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess my answer to any of the, the democracy stuff or to dialogue with it is that's great if it has respect for your other humans yeah. um, and is, uh, is powered by the love of God and the love of others. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And is there anything else you'd like to add or be asked about? Um, no, I think I just, I appreciate the ability to sit down, talk, and to be asked hard questions. These, it, it's wonderful to sit down with somebody that asks hard, in-depth questions and to, to figure out a little bit of, what do I think about these things? Because um, it's easy to go throughout a day without having to think, what does my faith um, ask me about this? And so... Um, I think one of the, the great things, if this is going to be on Facebook or any social media, is I, I wonder to people out there, how does your faith inform uh, how you do things? How is your faith going to um, inform the, what you really think? How does the life of, for those that are Christians, how does the life of Jesus, the, the gospel of Jesus, inform how you think yeah, about yeah, this world, how you think this, about this government, line, relations, yeah. friends, yeah. people, yeah. others. Um, how does that work for you? Thank you, thank you. And that, um, that was uh, Father Matt of uh, St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Fremont, Ohio. And uh, with that, signing off. <laughs>